Done. Okay, I'll read verse 1 and then we'll read every other verse together. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Ready? That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Ready? Who opposeth and exalteth himself again above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Ready? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he that now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. Ready? And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all powers and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, ready, that they all might be damned, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And let's pray. Father, I just pray that you would protect our church, protect us even now. I know Satan would love to cause disruption tonight. And uh, I heard some voices outside. I just, I just pray that you just, dr just bring them away and, and, uh, and protect us tonight. And protect our vehicles, everything, Lord. I just pray that you'd be, be there for us tonight. And then also I pray that you just give me power, that you use me as I speak to the folks. And I pray that they'd all have ears to, ears to hear and you do your eternal work in our midst. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Okay, I'm going to preach a message to you, and I don't know if I'm going to take long tonight. I'm going to try to be very brief, uh, but when I say brief, that doesn't always mean quick. I'm going to preach a message simply entitled, The End Times and What to Do About It. The End Times and What to Do. I believe we're in it. We're in the times where the Lord's coming very soon. And uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to show this to you. I'm going to show you from the scriptures here, what we just read here is almost like reading reading a periodical or a newspaper uh, of what's happening today in our world. It's, a, it's very interesting. Um, first of all, I want to go verse by verse. I'm going to teach every verse to you, and I'm going to help you to understand it. So I'm going to, I'm going to hopefully, I'm going to give you understanding, because I know that theology can be difficult, and some of these verses can be a little bit over our heads. And so I'm going to try to bring it down to everywhere. You know, as they say, bring the jam down to the bottom shelf so everybody can get it. And so I'm going to do that tonight. I'm going to try my hardest to do that for you. And so verse 1 is our theme. Okay, that's our theme. And what is that? The theme is the rapture. And you say, what is the rapture? Well, it's an it's a actual Latin word. It means to be caught up. And uh, you'll see that in verse 1. The rapture means to be caught up. And there's an event that's going to happen. It's a prophetic event that's going to happen where the Lord Jesus Christ is actually going to come in the clouds. And he's going to bring all the people that have died in the Lord. Okay, all the people. I'm talking about the apostles. I'm talking about all the Christians that for 2,000 years. Amen, it's going to be a lot of people. Amen. And he's going to bring them in the clouds. And then there's going to be a trumpet sound. And then, and then all these people are just going to come down and meet their bodies. Okay, it's just in a very split second. Uh, Apostle Paul told us it would happen in a twinkling of an eye. And then it, it's also covered in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. We won't go there, but that's, that's where it's covered. And it says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. So if the rapture were to happen right now, we'd disappear. It would just be clothes piled up on the floor, and we would be gone. You say, well, where would we, where would we be? We would be in the clouds with the Lord, and we would meet him there. And uh, if, if, if you're not saved, if you've never been saved, if you do not have the Holy Spirit abiding within, then you'll stay here and you'll, need, and you'll have to go through an awful period of time called the seven-year tribulation. 
And you don't want to be here, honestly. It'll be an awful time. Uh, there will be some revival here on the earth, it's, it, and I, I don't have time to get into all that. Uh, it would take me all night to explain that to you. But, but we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll preach some more messages on prophecy. Probably perhaps next Sunday I'll, I'll also cover a few things on prophecy as well. But, but we're going to go and meet the Lord. Amen? And, and it's, a, it's a wonderful time. Uh, remember before the flood? Noah went into the ark, didn't he? But there was another event that happened as well. There was a man by the name of Enoch. Remember Enoch? Well, if you don't know this, there was a man named Enoch, and he was walking with God, and one day God translated Enoch. He just took him to heaven without dying. Can you imagine that? He just went, whoop, he was gone. And they looked for him, and they couldn't find Enoch. There was another man that was taken up. Remember his name? He was Elijah. Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind, wasn't he? And uh, he hasn't been back, but he is coming back according to the word of God. He is going to come back before the, the, the second coming of Christ. And I, I can also explain that to you as well. But it's an amazing time. Um, and, and notice verse 1 again. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. You see that? Our gathering together. That's the rapture. Okay. We're just gathered together. And at that moment... The moment we are all gathered together, it's a glorious moment. I just can't wait for that moment. I, I would love it to happen right now. Wouldn't it be great? And, and we will become the church of the firstborn. I mean, it just gives me shivers just thinking about it. It's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. What a wonderful plan the Lord has for us that he's going to shield us from judgment. He's just going to take us out of here. And uh, he, he says in, in passages, he says, I come like a thief in the night. Right? So he's going to come and he's going to gather us together and uh, I don't know about you but I, I don't like the idea of dying okay I, 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 I'm not afraid of death I, if, if, if I'm going to die I'm going to die okay? I'll just go to be with the Lord that's fine but I don't know if I like the idea I don't like pain I, are you here that you don't like pain how many do not like pain like I don't like pain uh, I don't like pain uh, I remember when I broke my arm the first, second, and third time. It was excruciating pain. I hated it. Okay, and so I don't like pain. Nobody likes pain, and uh, so I don't like the idea of dying. I don't necessarily like the idea of being in the casket, putting it in the ground, and all that. But if that's what the Lord has for me, that's what will happen. Um, but it would be wonderful if the Lord would come and just take me out of here, and I wouldn't have to go through that. And the Bible gives us this blessed hope. This wonderful, uh, glorious appearing, this gathering together, uh, this rapture that we Christians talk about this. And so Paul, he's using this as the theme. Then notice he says that you be not soon, verse 2, soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So apparently there was a problem in that church. There were some people that were saying that the day of Christ was was, had come already. Uh, obviously, that was 2,000 years ago, so it hadn't come. What's the day of Christ referring to? Well, that's talking about the day of the Lord. Okay, what is the day of the Lord? Well, that's a future event again, a future prophetical event. It's not the rapture, actually. It's the, it's the, day, it's the, it's the battle of Armageddon. Have you heard of the battle of Armageddon? You, a lot of people don't know what that is. Well, Armageddon is the final battle between Jesus Christ and the Antichrist, who's going to rise up on the earth, we're going to learn about him in just a moment. And he's going to gather the world together. He's a world dictator. He's kind of like a Hitler. He's, he's yet to come. The Bible talks about him, prophesies about this Antichrist. And he's going to gather the world together into a one world government. And that's very interesting because we're seeing that form right now, aren't we? Uh, right before our eyes, we're actually watching the one world government form. And the Bible does tell us that the one world government will form before he appears. This, this Antichrist, this one world dictator. So he's coming. They're forming the world for this man of sin, the Bible calls him. But the day of Christ is, a, is at the end of the Antichrist time. It's a seven-year time. But at the end, there's a big battle. And it's going to take place in the, in the north part of Jerusalem. Okay, so if you go to Jerusalem and go north of Jerusalem, there's a plain there. It's called the Plain of Megiddo or the Valley of Megiddo. There's a little village called Megiddo there. You can, you can actually Google Earth it and see Megiddo and see this 
valley, it's, it's just the, the Jews have all the, all, and the people of Israel, they actually have all these plants and farms down there. But someday that valley is going to be the final battlefield between the Lord Jesus Christ and the armies on the earth. So that's what they're talking about when they say the day of Christ. But the day of Christ hadn't happened, but there were some people that were trying to scare him to say that it, it, it had happened. But it hadn't, obviously. Okay, so Paul's going to explain it to you. He's going to tell you the process of Armageddon, when Armageddon's going to come. And um, so verse 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, or the day of the Lord, or the day of Christ, shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Do you see that? Now that's the first, that's the first ingredient or, 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 or uh, the, the first thing that's going to happen that kind of, so to speak, opens our eyes to the fact that the day of Christ is at hand. This falling away. Now if you look that up, that word falling away, that phrase falling away, in the Greek, it's the Greek word apostasia. It's where we get the word apostasy from. Now what is apostasy? Well, apostasy is when people depart from the faith. A departure from the Christian faith. Now, there has not been a time in, in history uh, of Western culture when there has been such a departure of the faith in what, we, what we're living in now. Okay? Every mainline Protestant denomination is losing membership quickly. Uh, I've even had folks talk to me today saying that church is closed down, that church is closed down, that church is for sale. Something's happening, folks. There's a departure. People are actually leaving the churches. And where are they going? Well, they're leaving the faith, too. I mean, I went, Thursday, I was, I was a little bit frustrated, <laughs> Barry, on Thursday trying to talk to people. And everybody, there's a, there's a world mind going on right now. And I'm sure you've heard this before. Oh, you know, everybody's right about God. Have you heard that one? You know, everybody's right about God. You know, the, the Buddhists are right about the God and, and, and the Hindus are right about the God and, and, and all these people are right about God. Folks, if everybody's right, then nobody's right. You see that? And so that's, that, that's a very, very good sign of apostasy. And there's a lot of people that are involved in this apostasy, this, this kind of amalgamation of this multi-faith going on, uh, where everybody's just coming together into one religion. Uh, folks, uh, and they're all compromising, they're leaving the historic Christian faith, the historic Christian values, they're taking on like another faith, really. Okay, now that's a sign of the times. I believe that that's a very clear sign that we're living in the time where very soon we're going to be caught out of here. Because I can see very clearly that there is a falling away. There is a lot of groups that are, that are just, you know, I mean, every year they get smaller and smaller and smaller. It's true. They're just getting smaller. And you know that's true. And everybody's talking about it. I mean, people, Christians and non-Christians alike, everybody's talking about this, this departure where people are just leaving the churches and, and, it's just, and, and more and more people. Load of, I, I, people, I go downtown and I start talking and I get somebody, oh, I'm an atheist. I get a lot of people. I'm an atheist or I'm an agnostic. I had a guy on Thursday. He, he says, I said, well, sir, what you're saying is, 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 is agnostic. And he says, yes, and I am. I'm proud of that. I'm, I'm a proud agnostic. And I thought, oh, good night. And finally, I mean, I couldn't really even talk to him. You ever, you ever try to talk to somebody and they just keep talking and, and you, you can't get anything in? And you listen to them and you, you're trying to be polite and you're trying to listen to them. And finally, I said, sir, you don't listen to me. I mean, I'm trying to talk to you. I'm listening to you. I'm respecting you, but you're not listening to me. So I, I need to go. Because obviously, and, and, and it just, it, it wasn't happening. So you see that happening. Uh, you see, um, I, I remember I was in a meeting with a bunch of Christians, and, and I, I was talking about creationism. And this lady says, oh, well, uh, I don't believe in the six-day creation. I said, what do you believe in? She says, I believe in evolution. Folks, you, do you realize that if, if evolution is true, then we need to take the first 11 chapters of Genesis, Genesis away and call it a myth. And if we take away the first 11 chapters of Genesis away, we might as well just throw the whole Bible away, and that's exactly what they want us to do. I believe in the six-day creation. Now, I know they call me stupid and idiot. I, I've, heard, I've heard some of them talking. 
Mr. Dawkins doesn't like us too much. But we see... It, it, honestly, Mr. Dawkins is a sign of the times. He is. And people listening to him is a sign of the times. This falling away is spoken of in the Scriptures. This apostasy. Where in, in, in England, we, we're a Christian nation, but where's our Christianity today? It's going, isn't it? Where are, our, where are our Christian values that our grandparents had and our great-grandparents had? And where, where is the time when we, we had a great reverence for the, for the Bible? But now we're printing 10-pound notes with Darwin on the back. Now, can't you see that? Can't you see that when Christ says there's a... There, or when the Bible says that there's a falling away first, that we're living in that time? You know, it's, it's, it's kind of like when you see a car coming and you're looking down the road and you see a car coming and you can describe that car. You can, tell, you can say, I know what color that car is. I know what brand that car is, the make of that car. I can even see the driver behind the steering wheel. And it's coming really close and it just goes right past you. It's almost like that when you read these scriptures because you can see it very clearly, can't you? There's that falling away first. And then we go on, it says, and that man of sin is be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, there's only two son of perditions in the Bible. The first son of perdition is Judas Iscariot. Jesus called him the son of perdition. If you didn't know that, you do now. And that's interesting. Study Judas Iscariot's life. And you'll find out that he's a type of Antichrist. Satan possessed Judas Iscariot. Satan will possess the Antichrist. Judas Iscariot was, was, everybody believed he was a believer, but he wasn't. Antichrist will be the same. They'll think he's a believer in God, but he isn't. It's the same thing. So it's very interesting that the Bible calls the Antichrist the son of perdition, which simply means son of destruction. Now look at verse 4. This is very interesting. It says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or is worship, so he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So verse 4 is talking about his self-exaltation, that the Antichrist is actually going to exalt himself as God, and it says he sits in the temple of God. Well, folks, there is no temple, is there? The Jewish temple is not there. If you go to the Temple Mount, there's this dome on the rock. You know what I'm talking about? Go to Jerusalem. There's this dome on the rock. That's an Islamic, what do you call it, monument. Okay, that's it. And there's a mosque called the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Right there in the Temple Mount. But the Bible says that the Jews will rebuild their temple. Well, guess what, folks? The Jews are in the process of rebuilding their temple. They are gathering the, the, the goods together and they're going to... Folks, the Bible says they're going to rebuild their temple. And this man of sin is going to make a, comp, a, comp, a contract with the Jewish people in the world where the Jews will be able to rebuild their temple. The temple will be rebuilt. And then this Antichrist is going to go into the temple and he's going to make a proclamation, which is the abomination of desolation. He's going to make a proclamation that he is God. That's what it's saying there. That's right. Apostle Paul tells us, and it says here, he's going to go in that temple and he's going to make a proclamation. He's going to say, I am God. Worship me. That's blasphemy. That's blasphemy. He's going to commit the ultimate sin of blasphemy against his maker. God, God makes this man, but this man's going to rise himself up and he's going to say, I'm God. And that's the same thing that Satan did. Same thing. Look at verse 5. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. So it's already going on in the world. This self-exaltation. People, I've had people tell me, I'm God. God is within us all. Have you heard that one? This new ageism that's going on in our planet, folks, is an exaltation of man. Okay, and it's happening. And it's even happening in churches. And that's a part of the apostasy too. Okay, that's very interesting. So what is it that, 
withholdeth. Now look at verse 7 again. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. He, who is he? Well, that's the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Folks, you know what's stopping the Antichrist from coming to this earth? We are. We're the only group right now, and not just our church, but born-again believers all over this planet are stopping the Antichrist from being revealed. And then when the Holy Spirit is taken out, remember he came down in the book of Acts, chapter 2, remember he came down, boom, empowered the believers in the book of Acts, he's going to be taken out too. And when he's taken out, we're going to go with him. It's called the rapture. So that's the, that's the comfort we have. You say, boy, I don't want that Antichrist to come in my lifetime. He won't. Unless you're unsaved. If you've, never, if you've never been born again, you need to get born again and get the Holy Spirit inside of you. So you don't have to go through this time of tribulation with this man of sin because he's going to make Adolf Hitler look like a Sunday school teacher. Let me tell you that for sure. And this is biblical, just like John 3.16 is biblical. Okay? Look at verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's Armageddon. That's when Jesus comes in the clouds on a white horse. This Revelation 19 covers it. He comes down on a white horse and he, and he says there's a sword coming out of his mouth. Now that's a symbol of the word of God. And so the word of Christ just cuts through that Antichrist and destroys him. Okay, that's that final ba battle in the, in the valley of Megiddo. Okay, and it says here that the Lord's going to come and destroy him. All right. Even him, verse 9, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all powers and signs and lying wonders. Now let me tell you something about this Antichrist. He's going to have supernatural ability. The Bible says, and I, we don't have time to get into it. There's a lot of things we don't have time to get into, but we'll try to add to what I'm preaching on tonight. But, but the, the Bible talks about the, the, the Antichrist actually calling down fire from heaven. He talks about this, this uh, false prophet who actually will give uh, the image of the Antichrist. They're going to build this, this, this clone, I believe it's going to be, of the Antichrist, and he's going to, and he's going to give that clone life. And he's going to say, look, we gave life to a person, and we're just as good as God. Worship him, the clone. Yeah. That's the image of the beast. Yeah. It's going to happen, folks. And the Bible says the Lord's going to destroy him. In verse 8 and verse 9, it says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all powers and signs and lying wonders. He's going to bring powers. He's going to bring signs. He's going to bring lying wonders. And look at verse 10. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. you see that? And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should be, believe a lie. So this is a judgment. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth but have pleasure in righteousness. And so what this is teaching is this. It's saying people who reject the gospel will believe the lie. When they reject it, they say, I don't want God. I don't want the Lord Jesus Christ to save me. Then, then, then God says, okay, well, you're reserved for this other judgment I have where this man of sin is going to come and he's going to have a lying wonder and you're going to believe it. I mean, the world is just clamoring for some kind of lying wonder. You know, some UFO to come on this earth and, you know, little green men coming out from the UFO and everybody's going to believe in the little green men. I mean, it, they're, they're, people, I mean it's funny what people, it's, 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 it's humorous what people believe, isn't it? I mean, even the things that I believed before I became a Christian. It's, it's, it's funny, it's humorous. But it's, it's also very sad. It's also very sad. And the Bible says God's going to send them a strong delusion that they might be, believe a lie, that they might be damned 
who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. God says, because people just, just living for themselves, living for sin. Listen, we were out there last night in, in, in the clubbing going on last night and, and the people the, the, the people dressed and, or, or, or undressed or whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, going out there and, and, and they're just living for unrighteousness, folks. They're just, just living for the moment, living for the, living for the thrill, living for the, the excitement, living for the drug, whatever they're, they're putting into themselves, they're living for the unrighteousness and they're having pleasure in it and God says, okay, you want to have pleasure in that, that, that you're going to believe that lie too. And there's a judgment coming and we need to warn people. They may think I'm crazy. They may think I'm out of my mind. But let me tell you something. I don't want what they have. I don't. I don't want to go through that tribulation. No way on this earth. Uh -uh, I've already read about it. And folks, we can see this, these events very clearly. We can see this world order setting up. We can see that they're, they're waiting for a world leader to come on the scene. He's, it's not Obama, folks. Okay? It's not. But they are looking for a leader that everybody can follow. The world is globalizing. Now all the corporations are globalizing. They're not American companies, folks. They are global companies. McDonald's is not an American company. I, I, people, I, you know, I, I, people fighting McDonald's. You know, they, well, I'm against McDonald's. Can I tell you something? McDonald's is not America. It's from America, but it's not American. It's global now. It's an international company. You know, remember what happened at the, at, at the BP? Remember that? The, back in the Gulf of Mexico? The, 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 what is it called? The deep well drilling accident and all this, this oil just went everywhere. And they blamed BP for that. Remember? Do you remember that? But the BP turned around and said, we're not British, we are international. That's what they said. You can read it for yourself. That's what BP said. We're not British Petroleum anymore, we're just BP. We're an international company. We're not, we're, we're not, we're not tied to borders. We can put our bank anywhere. We can put our account anywhere on this planet. We're not just... We, we may have people in our company who are British and American, but we have people in our company from everywhere. We're international. KFC is international. McDonald's is international. Coca-Cola is international. They're international companies. You can study it for yourself. They're global companies, part of a global market, and they're working together for a global society. And they are putting it together to have a global leader. And they're fixing it now, folks. You say, do you think that the global market collapse is a part? It's, folks, they orchestrate a lot of these things. I don't think it's all orchestrated. But I think that there are opportunists, opportunists looking to take advantage of these things. Absolutely. They take advantage of it and they start, a, they start something. You say, are you anti... No, 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 listen. I, I, as the Bible tells us that we're not supposed to fight these people. We're supposed to pray for them. I'm not going to picket Parliament tomorrow. I have, a better, I, have, I have something better to do, and that's to win people to Jesus Christ. That's my job. To win people to Jesus Christ and to baptize them and to teach them to observe all things. But we need to be aware that something is happening in our world today and the Bible's prophesying it. The Bible's prophesying a world dictator. So when the world dictator comes along and we disappear and you're here, don't think I'm crazy then, okay? Don't think a UFO came and took me away. My Lord took me away. But I certainly don't want you to be here when that happens. I want you to come with me. Because we're going to be in a much better place. Amen? Amen? So what are we going to do? Oh, by the way, folks, uh, we have computers today who um, can actually, we can actually now, we have the, the capabilities to inject a computer chip underneath the skin. Did you know that the Bible says that the mark of the beast is actually in the forehead and in the right hand? Did you know that the new translations say on? All of the new translations say on, but the King James Bible says in? Isn't that interesting? Changes the O to an I. So the King James Bible tells us about the injection. 
there's an actual injection of a microchip that will be connected to the computer systems of the world. You say, well, that's scary, that's freaky. It's not scary and freaky, it's exciting because it tells me that we're coming, that the car's coming, I can see it clearly, amen? The world is globalizing, it's liberalizing. Biblical, biblical Christianity is losing popularity. It is. They're, they're, listen, there are people in this society that hate me. What have I done to them? Why do they hate me? Why do they yell at me? From ah, Hallelujah, what, what's, what's that all about? I mean, yesterday I was out witnessing to some people. We were standing there witnessing, and these people were out in this pub, and they're just yelling, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Bible bashers. What have I done to them? I don't even know those people. By the way, that's nothing new. That's been going on for a couple thousand years. It's, that's not new. But, it, it, but we can see the, the, the resentment growing for biblical Christianity. What are we going to do? Well, let me just give you three things, and I'm going to make this really quick, quick and brief. And I made, by the way, that first part was quick and brief because I had a lot to tell you. First thing we need to do is stand. See, I don't want you to... Listen, the worst thing we can do is raise our hands up in the air and run out of here screaming. <laughs> that's the worst thing we can do. I'm not, that's not why I'm standing up here today. That's not why Paul, Apostle Paul taught us these things. He taught us these things so we wouldn't be confused about it, so we would know the order of events, and that would bring us comfort. Because the Bible already knows how this world's going to end out. I mean, folks, read the end of the book of Revelation, you'll find out that we're winners, that we're winning, that we won. Okay? So you don't have to throw your hands up and, and run out of here screaming, that, you know, they're after me, they're after me. Okay? You don't have to worry about it, okay? The first thing we need to do as Christians... You've been saved. You've trusted Jesus Christ. you put your faith in Christ. The wonderful, best decision you'll ever make. Guarantee you someday, when we're all standing before Jesus Christ, you'll be, man, you'll come to me, you'll say, Pastor, man, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you told me. I'm so glad you preached the truth. I'm glad you preached the Bible. Because it's true. You'll see. You'll see. Not one of these words are going to fall to the ground. They will be fulfilled. All right. The first thing we need to do is we need to stand. Now look at, um, if you would please, go to the book of, of Ephesians. And I'm going to show you what we need to do as Christians. Because I, I, you know, the thing that I worry about is when I start talking about prophecy, then everybody gets scared and, and you know, we get, we, we're looking for ghosts in our closet, you know, the ethereal skeletons waiting for us when we get home, you know, the doctor death with his big hood, you know, knocking on our door, you know, open the, open the door and there he is with his sickle and his, you know, uh, bony finger going, come, 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 you know. Okay, that's not why I'm preaching this, okay? That's not the reason. All right, look at... Um, Let's, uh, let me just turn to it. Ephesians chapter number 6. Can I have a glass of hot water? Uh -huh. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's great. All right. Look at verse 13. Oh, verse 12. Let's look at verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Amen? But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world. See that? So this world is con it's combined with the rulers of darkness, and this is talking about demons, folks. Don't don't ever don't ever wonder why this world does so much evil. Why so so much evil happens in this world? Can I tell you the world is connected with evil on a spiritual scale? Now, folks, once again, I don't want you. Okay, you know, I, I have people sometimes they'll look at these things and say, "Well, I'm against Britain." Can I tell you that's not the way God wants you to be? He wants you to pray for, for Prime Minister Cameron and respect him. We need to pray for our leaders. We do have freedom. We paid a price for it. Amen? So I'm not against... I, listen, I pray, I pray for the Prime Minister. Pray for the, the leaders of, of Parliament. Pray for our country. Pray for our, We need prayer. Our nation needs prayer. Our leaders need prayer. Why? Because of this, the, the darkness is trying to get involved in their lives, and we need to pray that God will, will deliver them 
And the Bible says, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We need to pray for our leaders. You know, this idea of, oh, I'm going to fight them. I, listen, I am not going to fight. You're not going to see me. I'm, once again, I'm not, you're not going to see me down in Parliament waving a banner. I'm not going to do it, okay? That's not my area. My area is to win souls to Christ. I'm going to fight against the forces of darkness by winning people to Jesus Christ. Amen? That's how I'm fighting, and that's how I want us to fight. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Okay, we're not fighting people here. We're fighting forces of evil on a spiritual level. It says here, against rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having all, done all, to stand. So, when you get to the end of it, the Bible says, just stand. That's what I'm going to do. That's my, that's my goal. That's, my, that's, what I, that's what I want to do the rest of my life. I just want to stand for Christ. If the whole world turns against me, I still want to stand for Christ. If the whole world says, I don't believe in biblical Christianity, I hate biblical Christianity, I'll say, well, I'm going to stand for Christ. If they yell, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the Lord, and they mock me, I'm still going to stand for, the, for, for Christ. And that's what I want you to do, because that's the best thing to do. That's the best thing to do, isn't it? Okay? And we need to take on the whole armor of God. Did you realize that you have spiritual armor, Christian? Yeah, it says here. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Now, that's a belt. Okay, soldiers would wear a belt. They would have like, a, like, a, like something here because it, the strength is usually right here in the loins in this part of your body. Okay, the, the strength to fight a battle. Okay, you need strong legs. You need to stand. You need to get that stance right. Okay, teach you guys how, when you're boxing, right? Yeah, okay, you got it, all right. Okay, got that loins girt about with truth. So you need to get in the truth, amen? Yeah, okay, look again, it says having the breastplate, breastplate sorry, of righteousness. So that means that breastplate, and when Satan starts swinging his sword at you, you're, you, you're living right. Got that outward righteous life. God wants us to live right, amen? Okay, let's look on here. It says here, uh, let's see here. It says, in your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It's important to have good footwork. Amen? Do you have good footwork? And uh, it, it, once again, when a guy's boxing, they always talk about the feet. You know, having the feet in the right place. Anybody here a boxer? You know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever, ever did any? Yeah. Oh, okay. There you go. All right. All right. So when, when you do boxing, uh, you, they, they always talk about the footwork. Okay, having your feet right in the right place. And whenever you do like martial arts or anything like that, there's footwork involved. Okay, it says here, uh, and above all, taking the shield of faith. The shield is the one that, that protects your whole body. By the way, the Roman shield covered the whole body from the fiery darts of the wicked here, it says, that ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and then take the helmet of salvation. Why do you have to have the helmet of salvation? Well, folks, if I lose this, I'm going to live. 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 If I lose this, I'm dead. If I'm headless, I'm deadless. Amen? I'm gone. I'm history. So that helmet of salvation is the most important thing. Get your salvation secure. Make sure you're in the faith. Make sure you have a salvation testimony. And if you do not have a salvation testimony, please see me and let's get that settled. Okay? Because you need that. And then it says the sword of the Spirit. Now the sword is the fighting implement. And it says which is the what? The Word of God. This is what we use to fight the devil. The Word of God. Remember when Satan came to Jesus? And he says, hey, turn those stones into bread. And Jesus said, it is written that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's fighting with the sword of the Spirit. What is Jesus going to use against the Antichrist when he comes on the white horse? I can tell you what he's going to use. He's going to use the word of God. He's going to smite the wicked with the Bible. He sure will. And you know what? This book is powerful, my friend. This book is powerful. The Bible says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This is powerful. That's why, listen, when you come to this church, I'll, I'll get you a Bible. Why do I give you a Bible? Because I want you to have the sword of the spirit. I don't want you to fight the, the forces of evil without your sword. Amen? So I give you a Bible. 
And the King James Bible is, 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 is based on the correct manuscripts. It has the correct un underlying text, and that's why I like to use the King James. Because it's sharp. <laughs> it's interesting that when we got into the new translations, Bible memorization mostly just went out the door. But even people, when they do the Lord's Prayer, they do it the King James Bible way. Isn't that interesting? Why is that? Many of the songs that they still sing in, in Protestant churches, they sing it the King James Bible way. They do, folks. It's very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. See, Satan wants to replace our sword, or he wants to give us a duller soul, sword. <laughs> but I want to keep the sharp sword. <laughs> Because we're in a battle, folks, and it's even, it's even worse today than it was when we were kids. And we need, we need to be sharp. Amen? So that's why, that's why I give you that King James Bible, because it's so important that you have the sword of the Spirit. And then with all those areas of equipment, we need to stand. That's the first thing. Stand. Secondly, we need to grow in biblical knowledge. Now I'm going to show you a verse that's kind of sad, but it's found in the book of Hosea. Now, I know it may be hard for you to find the book of Hosea, so... If you can find it, go for it. If you can't find it, just look intelligently at the page you're at now. And I'm kidding with you. If you go in the Old Testament, if you go to the book of glossary, it's in the front of your, or, or the, the book of table of contents. Uh, it's in the front of your Bible. Just go to the book of table of contents and you'll give you a page number. I'm joking, folks. I'm, I'm, being, I'm, I'm being funny, but it's not working very well. You're all making faces. <laughs> Chapter 4 and verse 6. We're almost done. Actually, I'm making good time. Look at verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of what? Knowledge. Knowledge. Notice that. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will reject thee. Oh, that's, that's an awful thing. That thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. That is an awful indictment against Israel. It is. They forgot the Lord. They were not teaching the people. Listen, one thing that I'm going to try my hardest to do in this church is to teach you the Word of God. This ministry is not just for the preaching. This ministry is for the teaching. That, listen, we, we already have two Bible studies a week, and we're going to have more Bible studies. I promise you, I want to teach you the Word of God. I'm not just preaching to you, folks. I want to teach you because I, I, I think you need to learn. In fact, I need to learn. You say, Who, who's going to teach me? Well, I'm studying, folks. I'm studying and getting material to teach you because I want you to learn because people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. People are destroyed. Uh, before we came to church tonight, um, Mary Beth was showing me this funny clip about some, some ladies in America. They, they, they did this U.S. Um, beauty contest for, you know, so they had missed. And they were, the question was, what was the question? What do they think about mass? What do they think about mass? What do they think about mass? And these ladies came up with some of the most ridiculous things you've ever heard. All right. And it, it, it's funny, but it's sad. And one of, the one of the problems in our society today is a lot of people just don't have a lot of learning. Okay? Now, I'm not mad at you if you didn't have a lot of learning. But you know what? You don't have to stay there. You can learn. Amen? You know, just a, just a year ago, now, I have a Bachelor of Science degree. You say, ooh, I'm impressed. I can see the looks of impressed on your face. I was just amazing, huh? Bachelor of Science, what is that? Well, it's Bachelor of Science. It's a four-year degree. I've, I've got a Bachelor of Science degree in theology. I can still see you're very impressed, okay? Now, I'm almost 50. I'm 47. This two and a half more years, I'll be 50. Right? I'm an older guy, and just recently they were doing a, uh, from my Bible college when I went to in America, they did this online master's program, and I signed up. Boy, I have learned so much in this last year from that online master's program, and I just feel like 
I was dumb before I got in that master's program. I, and, and you know, it's just, what is that? Well, it's, it's growing in knowledge. Now, is it so I can be puffed up and say, I'm a, I'm a man of, you know, I have a master's. I'm important. <laughs> That's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing it so that I can give you something. I'm doing it for you. I'm going to do it for, for me. I'm doing it for you because I believe that if I can get some more knowledge, then I'm going to give it to you because I'll give you the master's program. Amen. I'll, I'll take the master's program and then I'll give it out to you week by week, sermon by sermon, Bible study by Bible study. I'll give you the knowledge that I've received. There are no self-made people. We're all a result of somebody else giving us the knowledge. Amen. I'm not a self-made man. Somebody taught me. I was discipled. And now I want to disciple you. I want to help you grow so that you're not destroyed. Because the Bible says my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. We need to grow in knowledge. That's why it's so important that every message you just sit at the edge of your seat and listen. That's why every Bible study you need to listen. If you've got questions, just take me aside. Say, Pastor, I got some questions. And I know you do. I, man, there were times, Gavin, man, he drive me crazy with questions. I mean, I've... <laughs> You've got to keep asking me questions, Gavin. You've gotten quiet lately. Yeah? Uh-huh. I want, I want you getting back some questions. He, he'd sit in the car and he'd ask me questions all day long. And by the end of the day, I'm like, phew, good night, man. I think I need to go back in my Bible. It's almost like, i got an empty tank. I need to go refill it. But that's a good thing because then I can get some more knowledge and I can give it out. You know, God doesn't want us like lakes, amen? We're just taking, taking, and receiving and receiving and not giving. God wants us to be like a river. You just take, receive knowledge and give knowledge. Receive knowledge and give knowledge. And you know what? If you receive the knowledge and you give the knowledge, there won't be room enough to contain all the people in here. Because the people that are out there that, that look, at, look at me with disdain, a lot of them, they just don't understand. It's ignorance. It's not the fact that I'm a bad guy. It's, it's the fact that they just never learned it. And you know how it is when people don't learn something? We don't want to admit it, do you? You ever ask people for directions? You know, you go downtown and you say, well, I, I, need to find the, I need to find the supermarket. Can you tell me? And, they, and oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, the, 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 bus, the, the, the bus is broken down at the corner there. You turn right, you know, and then you come to a, 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 a big tree, a big oak tree, turn left, and... Okay, and so you, you're lost again. Well, why did they do that? Because people just don't like to admit that they just didn't know. Have you ever done that? We won't admit it, will we? Yeah. We need to get some knowledge, my friend. We need to get some knowledge. And then the last thing I want to talk about is maintain your focus. Okay, so the first thing we need to do, not, we don't need to run out of your screaming. Oh! tribulations coming the antichrist is going to be here before long that's not what we're that's not the purpose of the message the purpose of the message is to tell us we need to stand we need to really be serious i think you need to be more serious now than you ever have been about learning your bible mm -hmm. and then the last thing maintain your focus maintain your focus look at mark chapter 16 this is the last thing i want to talk about and then i'll close You've been a good, good group tonight. Maintain our focus. New chapter, Mark chapter 16. What's my focus? Well, my focus, I'm a Christian, okay? And my focus is Jesus Christ. Should there be any other focus for me? You know, people like to get me in these de denominational talks. You know what? I'm not interested in bashing other denominations of Christians. I'm not interested. I'm just not. They can do what they want to do. They can get on with it. I'm not interested in bashing them. I'm interested in serving my Lord and Savior. I don't want my focus on any other thing than Jesus. Amen? Amen? And look what it says here in verse 15. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What's our focus? To go and to preach the gospel to every creature. That's our focus, Christian. What's your focus? What's your focus, Dave Salt? Is your focus at getting a building? Oh, I'd love to have our own building. But that's not my focus. What's my focus? 
To go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's our focus. That's where we need to keep our focus. And it seems like Satan's always trying to get me away from my focus. He's always trying to bring other influences to me to get me away from my focus. But my focus is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's my focus. And that's your focus. My focus is not to fight Britain. My focus is not to fight America. You're not going to see me at Wall Street tomorrow waving placards in Wall Street. Unless it's, it's me going down there with a the Bible witnessing to these people that are waving the placards. Amen? That's my focus. I, get, I went down on... Listen, last night when I went down to downtown area, we fed some people, didn't we? But, but what was our focus, Barry? Our focus was to witness to these people. That was our focus. Now sometimes you have to be, you know, you have to be slow with some people, but there's some people you can just go right to it. And we need to be sensitive to the Lord and to His leading in our lives. And we need to focus on on the, the main objective. Listen, the focus of Faith Baptist Church is to preach the gospel to every creature. That's our focus. That's our mission. Our mi my mission is not to fight Britain. My mission is not to fight America. Or my mission is not to fight the New World Order. My mission is to give the gospel to every creature. Jesus did never said, and, 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 and you can look here in vain, there was not one time that the Christians fought Rome. And you can look in vain. They never fought Rome. They were imprisoned by Rome, but they never fought Rome. And why did they get imprisoned by Rome? Because they were preaching the gospel so much and so many people were getting saved that Rome was changing. That's what we need to do. We need to preach the gospel so much to so many people that so many people get on our side and Britain changes and becomes more godly and more, and more free. That's what we need to do. That's our focus. The focus for Preston is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The focus for London is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The focus for New York is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The focus of Chicago is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't care where you go in the world. The focus of every Christian is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no other focus. That's it. He said, go to every creature and preach the gospel. That's my focus. I'm not going to... You know, and, and we need to be aware that the Lord's coming. We need to realize that that car is coming down the road and very soon Jesus is going to come. And that ought to get us more of a focus into preaching the gospel to every creature because the time is short. We don't have much time left. I believe it's the 11th hour and soon Jesus is going to come and take us out of here. And the people that are left here would wish somebody had focused on the gospel rather than something else. Some secondary thing. Listen, if we're going to do a second, if we're going to have a drug rehab program, can I tell you what the drug rehab program is for? We're going to have a drug rehab program, but can I tell you what it's for? It's for the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we're going to have a homeless ministry, the homeless ministry is for the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we're going to have a, 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 a leafleting campaign, the leafleting campaign is for the gospel of Jesus Christ. No matter what we're doing in this church, I'm telling you, the main focus is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the kind of pastor you have. I, if I focus on a building, if we have a, if we have a building, uh, let me tell you something, that building will be sanctified for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we will use it for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything we do will be for the gospel of Jesus Christ. If it means having a soup kitchen, it will be a soup kitchen for the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we have a, a clothing program to give people clothing, it will be a clothing program for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't care what it is, it will be for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. You love that. That's our focus, my friend. Don't worry. You know what? You don't ever have to worry about me going off into some wildfire and, you know, uh, you know scary and weird and ethereal. I'm going to keep my focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ because that's what my Lord told me to do. That's what he told Paul to do. That's what he told Peter to do. And you can study their lives and you'll see that's what they did. That was their focus. Their focus was to go, to teach, to baptize, and to teach all things. That's it. Go, win, baptize, 
teach. Say it with me. Go, win, baptize, teach. Say it again. Go, win, baptize, teach. That's it. That's our focus. And if we keep that focus, we won't have the room to contain all the people in this place. Because that's the focus. And it's not so we can have a room to, that won't contain all the people that will fit in this place. That's not the reason why we're doing it. That's, that's not our focus. We're not, listen, I'm not, building, I'm not building the church. The Lord is. He's building this church. I'm not building this church. I'm just focusing on the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you folks, you know that. You folks that are around me, what do I talk about all the time? We're sinners. There's a penalty for sin. Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose again. And then you need to accept him and be born again. Amen. That's my focus. You ever wonder why? Because that's my focus. That's what I do. And that's what we all ought to do. That's what Christians should do. And I, you know what? We're living in a day where it seems like a lot of times we're not doing that. We're focusing on other things. We're focusing on the church service or, 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 or something else, something different. And Satan's laughing while all the world goes to hell. And Christians ought to be focused on the right thing. And what is the focus? The gospel. I, mean, I hope you get that. I hope that just rings in your head. You know, you wake up midnight and you're just screaming. You're going, the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's your focus, Christian. That's your focus. What do we need to do with all this in mind? And I'm closing. We need to stand. We need to grow in biblical knowledge. But the biblical knowledge is for the third thing, and the standing is for the third thing. What's the standing in the biblical knowledge for? So we can just be smart people? So we can be intelligent people? No. For the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll close with this. You know, when I talk to people, there are many times I'll talk to people and I'll think, you know what? I didn't do that right. I'm sorry, Lord. I need to learn more. Now, if I'm saying that, don't you think we all should be saying that? We need to be witnesses for Christ. And the reason why a lot of people won't witness for Christ is because we just don't have the knowledge. We're afraid. They're going to ask us the wrong question and we're not going to know the answer to that question. We'll grow in knowledge then. And maintain your focus. Maintain your focus. Don't lose that focus. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Thank you for listening. It was hot in here and you listened.